Thank you, everyone, for coming. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, Plone uh, as a CMS as a service. Um, and so my name's Dylan J. Who am I? Uh, that's my Twitter handle uh, there, if you want to tweet about that. Uh, this that's good. So I've been selling Plone. I've been I'm Plone Integrator. I've had a Plone company since about 2003, 2004. Um, I've founder of Web, uh based in Australia, Plone Integrator. Um, currently, uh, Plone UI team leader uh, as of two weeks ago. So uh, also founder of Predigov, which is our, our new uh, brand, uh, which is all about creating uh, CMS locally hosted uh, SaaS services for government, and we're currently doing that in, uh, in uh, three states in uh, Australia as well as the UK. That's our logo. Um, so what I, uh, a few months ago, I was at the Python uh, conference uh, in Australia, it's in Hobart, and uh, we were getting a taxi back to the airport, and Hobart's quite a small place, and the taxi driver's gone, uh, you know, he, he worked out we were from this Computer Geek conference and stuff. He'd obviously driven a few different people around, and uh, he was asking us about which framework to use, you know. Uh, so he was, said his friend's got this website, he wants to sort of sell books or something online. And I'm sitting there, and I'm going through that, you know, that same story you guys have probably had if you're, uh, you know, experienced with Plo, and you're going, well, you know, I know the Django people, they probably told you Django, maybe I'd do it in Pyramid, oh, then you'd probably have to set up your own server and you'd have to learn how to deploy it, and well, you could just do it in WordPress, and uh, you know, why, why can't I just say, do it in Plone? Why can't I do that? Um, and it's a shame, it's a shame. Why can't we tell everyone that Plone is the best solution to build a website with? Um, and in this conference, I've heard a number of different sort of statements along these kind of lines. So Plone is a, is a niche product. Um, Plone's really, you know, well suited for governments and EDU, maybe not other sort of stuff. Uh, Plone is an enterprise CMS, you know, enterprise meaning complicated and hard and uh, you're prob and expensive to uh, implement. Yep, Plone is, is excellent for intranets. So there was uh, the roadmap a few years ago said Plone is an intranet CMS and uh, uh, I th the problem with all of these is that it's, it's basically game over for Plone in the end. Uh, we're, we're painting ourselves into a corner and that's what I really want to talk about today. Um, so Plone is not really on the hype curve at the moment. Uh, what's interesting is uh, WordPress is, is still continuing to gain more traction. Um, and that's borne out. So I wanted to get a, 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 a thing showing how many Plone sites are installed. Unfortunately, you used to get that with build, uh, built with and stuff. Um, but they charge now to go back far enough. Um, but my theory is that basically the number of Plone sites out there at the moment has, you, you might think it's decreased, I think it's roughly a few thousand and it's roughly been about the same for a while. And the reason for that is the model of uh, acquiring a Plone site normally involves uh, dealing with a company, getting them to integrate. There aren't many people just a hobbyist say I want to blog and, and building their own Plone site and putting it out there. Um, so the, the number of uh, Plone sites is not really increasing um, because the ones that drop off are getting replaced by companies doing more installs. Uh, now, wh what's really happened, though, that's really changed is that the world has become much more CMS-centric. Uh, when Plone started out, it was one of the, the most popular CMSs. Um, and you can actually see that. It was, it was talked about more than uh, one of those graphs right at the end. You can't really see it. That's Plone, top of the chart. Well, Drupal and, and the other ones didn't exist, but you know. <laughs> um, so what's, what's really happened is that we've had this massive increase. This is out of uh, all websites in the world, right? Um, so that's a decrease in other technologies, and this is an increase overall of CMS use. And WordPress, by far, is the one that's taking over. It's 30, what does it say, 20%. So 20% of all websites in the world, all websites are WordPress, which is insane. Yep. Possibly true. Uh, a great share of those sites are just there for black SEO purposes. Possibly true. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> set up our own scamming. Yeah. I know people that are in the business and they spawn like several sites per day. Right. Good point. Um, in any case, uh, there has been a general increase in, in CMS usage and WordPress is uh, probably the most popular platform. Uh, I, uh, and the other ones are sort of increasing-ish. Joomla tends to go down a little bit. Drupal is uh, doing all right. Um, so what's possibly one of the reasons for that other than the, the scammers? Um, so getting started with WordPress, well, you can go to wordpress.com and you can get a site for free and you can sign up in, uh, let's say, an hour. You know, you can you know, choose a theme and muck around with it, put a bit of content up there. Uh, you could go to uh, any number of um, sort of hosting package um, ones that have a, a sort of cloud service. They have WordPress installed in Joomla and other things and you can just, you know, maybe another hour and, and you're maybe spending a little bit of money. Um, pretty much any LAMP hosting. Um, so that's that's not just a, a cloud service that replicates it over servers, that's a shared hosting and you can then install, again, same thing, something like cPanel, you can just go click install WordPress, it downloads all the, the, the code and, and sets up a WordPress site. Yep, so uh, any LAMP host, you could basically download the code and install it in your Apache directory uh, without having the cPanel, you know, nice little bits and pieces. Uh, you can download it onto your own box if you've got it. Uh, any VM host like like Amazon or something, you can do it that way. Uh, you can work with a WordPress web designer. It seems very popular. I know lots and lots of uh, graphic design firms who who specialize in WordPress. Um, uh, over and above, you know, other PHP CMSs. Uh, and because of the uh, the abundance of them, it's uh, probably a little bit cheaper. And you've got, you know, you can start with uh, themes. Um, and a lot of them are commercial themes. They're not just themes as we know them in Plone. They, they include sort of sample content and, and functionality in their theme as well. So you've got the kind of a base site out of the box. Um, so getting started with Plone, what are options? So we can work with a, this is probably the most popular option. We can work with a, a Plone company. Uh, it's going to cost you some money. You can use any VM host. You don't really have this cPanel thing. You have AWS uh, images and stuff like that a little bit, but mostly you're going to use Unified Installer and put it on a VM host on your own server. So we've got Plowed, which is pretty cool. You can go and set up a free site. Uh, but that's one, one tiny little service in a, in a sea of other potential services. Uh, and then your custom theme, you're pr pretty much going to get paid for a, a, a theme to be made or learn it yourself. So point is, you've got far fewer options here. So what, what is making WordPress the number one uh, CMS? Well, it's this idea of, of convenience, you know, that WordPress.com, you can just go there and get the site really easily. It's rapidly provisioned, just like you don't have to wait, you don't have to talk to people, you don't have to ask permission. Uh, and minimal management effort um, with a cloud kind of solution. So let's look at uh, what this cloud, is everyone kind of pretty know what the difference between IaaS and PaaS and SaaS is? Um, so shared services, generally the idea of a shared hosting is that you've got one host and you just split it amongst a whole bunch of uh, different websites. But it doesn't, your website doesn't kind of span over multiple services, it doesn't sort of scale up. Um, once everything's being hit on that box at once, everything's going to suffer a bit. Then you've got this idea of uh, you know, infrastructure as a service or software as a service, which means they're taking care of the scaling bit. They're load balancing across many servers and they're, they're scaling it up for you. You don't have to worry about that um, over, over, you know, lots of sites being hit at once type problem. And it comes in, in three different forms. So infrastructure means you're getting a, a virtual um, box. Uh, software as a service means you're getting some kind of application that you just kind of configure it, you don't program it. Um, and platform as a service means, well, you're programming it and you're not, and then the other stuff is done for you. You basically just push the code. So where does CMS fit into this? And, and this is something I sort of struggled with, this idea that CMS is, uh, you generally customize it quite a bit. There's a bit of programming involved, but you also configure it quite a bit. So, um, so CMS is software. It's something that you, you install, 
it has lots of functionality already. It, it's not a complete blank box. Uh, so it's not really a platform for building apps. But it is also a platform for building apps to some extent. And you can program and you can customize it. So it really kind of fits in between. Um, so something like WordPress.com is, is, is SaaS. You can't really do a lot. You can do CSS on there. And in fact, you have to pay to enable the extra module to do your own CSS. Otherwise, you're just using predefined themes. Um, Drupal Gardens, another, another example where you can get an instant site. Um, same sort of thing. You, you kind of just doing um, CSS changes. That's it. Uh, shared hosting type things, what, you, what you're doing is they, uh, they're installing a bunch of PHP and it's not really a maintained CMS solution. The code, once it's installed with cPanel and all these different things, is there uh, and it will rot and it will get hacked, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's not really a cloud solution. You're not getting the software maintained by someone else. Um, so does CMS as a service really exist? Um, Things like, the, I forgot to mention things like Squarespace. Um, they're, they're another example. Uh, again, CSS, you can't program them. Um, but Plone is, in fact, cloud by default. It comes out of the box as a cloud solution. So OneZope uh, can have many, many uh, Plone sites in it. Uh, and that's by default. It's there. You install a Plone uh, Zope box, and you have multi-site. Uh, which is pretty amazing given how many hoops these other CMSs have to go through to get multi-site. Um, and you have ZDO out of the box, right? Again, that means that you're running the same website over multiple boxes out of the box, you know, without really having to do much work. Uh, so that's many servers, multi, uh, multiple websites per box, that's cloud. And then we've got this idea of doing a bit of programming, making it into more platform as a service. So we've got things like Dexterity. We've got a kind of, it doesn't have a zip upload, but uh, you can at least configure it through the web. There isn't a way of doing Dexterity kind of upload a schema, is there? In, put a setup. Yes, you've got a zip file there. Yeah, true. Yep. Um, so Diazo, you have this great kind of zip file thing, and, and there's programming in there. And it's SSLT, you can do a little bit of programming. Um, it's, it's certainly uh, the most flexible online uh, theming experience, I think, that I've seen for anything. Uh, so it's kind of codish. Plomino, we've been doing a lot of Plomino. That is code. You've got, um, uh, you can create pretty, pretty complicated applications uh, using Plomino, and it's got a zip file format. Um, which we implemented uh, a couple of months ago, but before that had a big, big, huge XML format, which also worked. Um, so if you look at how lamp hosting, why is lamp hosting so cheap? Why is it so popular? Now, the biggest thing about it is this idea of overloading. And how it works is that with lamp hosting, right, when you're not when a site's not being accessed, the PHP is not in RAM. It's not taking up any resources. It's only taking up disk space. Uh, the site code itself, any customizations, your theme and stuff like that, also doesn't take any RAM if the site's not really being accessed. The DB, that will also get unloaded. Uh, so the, the only thing is, is that because you've got, so if you have like a, a shared LAMP shared hosting, and you've got WordPress, WordPress, WordPress. Each one is going to load the WordPress code each time it does actually get loaded. So you're not sharing the RAM there, really. Um, now, if we look at Zoop, so if we're using separate DBs, that's how we tend to configure it. Uh, the CMS code uh, is not unloaded. All the CMS is in there, and it's in the RAM, and it takes up quite a bit of RAM. It's a bit costly, and that's one of the things that makes uh, Zoop a little bit hard to scale. Um, your site code is not unloaded either because you've done it using file system uh, code. You've put in all your uh, your eggs and stuff like that. Uh, your DB uh, also doesn't get unloaded because you've got separate uh, dope Zope databases. You could probably do something in Zope to try and unload the the ZODB cache when uh, at which point a site's not being used. But separate databases basically means that all the databases are kept in memory. Until it until something forces it to unload, um, but 
you have CMS, uh, you know, if you're running one particular process and you're running uh, it with Zope, then all the CMS code is shared across all of it and you don't reuse, you can reuse it. Um, but what's really interesting, if we go all the way down to the bottom here, so it's actually quite a good um, solution. In fact, we're unloading um, most things uh, except the CMS code. Uh, and we're sharing the CMS code. So it's actually quite a good solution uh, for overselling. Um, uh, so, so what does this mean? It means that um, we can oversell a single server more than WordPress. We, we've done calculations. You can fit a crap load of sites on uh, a set of Zope instances. Um, maybe not as much as WordPress, but you know, considering that you're sharing the, the, the code of the CMS. Um, it's pretty pretty good. Um, so I'm really good at vaporware. I got halfway through running this. I haven't quite finished it, but basically this is the idea of having a package which changes uh, the the front page of uh, Zope. So you know how in Plone we uh, we've overridden the the Zope front page. This does the same thing, uh, except what it's doing is it allowing anonymous people to sign up for a site. Uh, you don't have to have an admin set. So the idea is that we can install Zope now. Um, you put it on a box, then you get tell everyone where it is, and they can sign up and get a site straight away. Um, so we've got that would take make cloud truly out of the box, uh, and, it, and it's pretty simple code. So through the web, um, I was reminded in Paul's. Uh, talk this morning of the first time I actually got into Python. Um, I was working at uh, Bell Labs and I'm, I'm like downloaded this Zope thing and I uh, we, we were into cheap ass games. Anyone played cheap ass games? It's this awesome uh, mail order service where you get these awesome kind of games and they had this great real time card game called Falling. So the first app I ever built, I, I implemented a real time card game using ZODB transactions to kind of do the arbitrage between the different things. Um, and it was very cool. And it was a, you know, maybe 20 lines of Python in a Python script with a little sort of uh, text based UI. And very, very simple to build. And I could do that without understanding any complicated things like build out or um, how to deploy it or anything like that. So this through the web code, is, uh, it's got a lot of bad press. Uh, and it's got a lot of negatives. These are the four kind of biggest negatives I've seen about through the web. So no version control. That's definitely a uh, potential problem. You know, it's nice to be able to, to keep the, the code and go back in revisions and stuff. And ZODB code doesn't have really proper version control. You can't use your normal development tools. Uh, it worked different than the file system code. So what you you get this uh, learning curve where you learn how to do it using Python scripts and things like that, and then suddenly you realize, oh, I want a little bit more. I need uh, something more complicated, and suddenly you're learning a whole different set of techniques in order to do the code. Uh, and then you had problems with restricted Python. There's only so much you could do. Um, however, uh, it had one really, really, really big benefit is that lots and lots and lots of people came across Python and uh, Zope by through, through the web thing. It's accessible, it's convenient. You can start and get going. You can have an online service and start programming straight away. Uh, through the web is more convenient than, say, App Engine. App Engine, you still have to download their SDK. You still have to install a few things, learn how to deploy it. Um, so through the web code, I think, is the winner here out of all those, because I think all of those things can be overcome in some way or another. So the Dulwich project's really interesting. The Dulwich project is a pure Python implementation of Git, both server and client. And it's well maintained, and it has, uh, I think, Google's um, contributing to quite a bit. So I started having a play with that. It supports the, uh, the HTTP protocol. Not the uh, so you can do sort of um, full pushes and everything via HTTP. Uh, multiple backends, so you can have it has a file store, but it also has this memory store, so that you can use the memory uh, part and keep the whole kind of Git server running in memory if you want. Uh, that's the Dulwich project. If you want to have a look, uh, if if you don't 
get the reference. Dulwich is actually the uh, the village at which uh, the uh, from a Monty Python skit, I think. So um, I started playing with this. Um, you can see this. Uh, this was a funny story. I tried to commit this yesterday. You might have seen in the collective there was the uh, collective, and it was just plone. So. GitHub has this problem, it takes off the .git at the end, so I originally called it plone.git and it made a big mess. Uh, thank you to Nutjob for fixing that. Um, so how this could work, right, this package. Uh, so you, you could branch, you can go into plone.app.theme and you could branch your theme. Instead of doing a copy, you just create a branch. Then you go into, say, a static thing in your local build out. We can do a git pull, we can just pull down that new branch that we created. Then we can, we can start developing it, we can run a, a local service, we can edit the theme and so on. Then we do a git push, straight back up. And as soon as we do a push, it does a checkout straight away. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's integrating with plone.resources, so it's, 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 it's purely for the theme stuff. Um, don't get too excited, this doesn't work yet. This is more vaporware. Uh, so that's the package. Um, I implemented, I did the smart HTTP stuff out of the Dulwich, I got that working so that view is there and it takes the different parameters and stuff like that. The only next part, uh, so to turn that memory object store into ZODB objects. So the idea is not um, some previous integrations with Git and Zope was trying to actually uh, map Zoop versions and history onto Git versions and stuff. This is not that, this is sticking a Git repository as into multiple objects in the ZODB, and then you would have all those versions there, and then you would check out from that. Wasteful in terms of memory and stuff, but all I want is to be able to push code up and pull code down. Um, so this is what I really want to talk about. I want to talk about a manifesto for how we go forward with Plone, how we become a winner in this, in this uh, very, very competitive CMS space. And this is where it gets a little bit controversial, maybe. So this is something we've been following the last year. This is the rules that my company has been working by. So we don't deploy any site-specific code anymore. We don't create eggs, which are, have profiles in them. We don't create themes in, in eggs. Or we at least don't deploy those. Uh, so the second rule is no site-specific code in eggs. So Diazo. Uh, we, we develop it locally in Egg so that we can, you know, have the file system developed locally. And then we just uh, deploy the zips when we want to deploy. Great, you don't need to bring the servers down. It's, uh, it's a lot. We don't need to run build out on, uh, on our production servers. It's quite nice. Uh, for application stuff, we've been using Plomino quite a lot um, when we want sort of different sort of database type stuff. And we're finding more and more uses for it. It's, 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 it's kind of like Django inside Plone. Um, it's a little bit rough around the edges in some bits, but it's incredibly powerful and, and reasonably easy to understand. So for template code, uh, Erica was asking me, was like, what if you want to create a new view for an item? Well, that's we created uh, listing views as one way to do that. The idea with listing views is to uh, create a, a very you basically just list, I want this field, I want this tail expression, this tail expression, and you have two options. You can have it on top of one content type. So you just use the display menu. Once you created the view in the control panel, you use a display menu, and you add it and say, I want this display. And then from there, it's the standard HTML, always kind of displayed using the same tags, and use Diazo to make it rearrange it any way you want. So for example, if you want the publish date, which isn't on a news item, you could just use this. Uh, theming plugins with the tail overrides and stuff uh, is also another solution. I think there's a better solution in all of this um, that we could have for doing through the web uh, type things, and it, I'd rather it avoid templates. But um, And then what we've done is we've really tried to sort of cut back um, the kind of uh, the building, we're, we're using building blocks like Plomino or Portlet pages or things that allow us to sort of customize the, uh, um, that we customize with Diazo. Um, so yeah, all of these sites that we've developed in the last year um, or made modifications to are all following those rules. So, 
And I want to go through a little bit of a case study. This is one that we've been uh, working on quite a bit lately. So this is uh, New South Wales came out with this new legislation that every single swimming pool in a six month period, which ends in three weeks by the way, uh, has to be registered. So they estimate there's 350,000 swimming pools in New South Wales, Australia. Um, so the idea is they get registered and they get inspected and less kids die. So it was a, a, a remarkably a lot more complicated than we thought. There's a lot of stuff in behind. The public registration bit is, is simple. It's only a few pages, but we're doing inspections. We're doing like uh, user approvals. Uh, uh, each council has a set of users. They have super users who approve the other users. Uh, and then the super users are approved by the DLG, which is the, the governing body across all the different councils. and. There's pool details, you can do view, view, whole history auditing of all the changes to the pool records and so on. Um, this is kind of cool, we, uh, this is using Go Mockingbird behind that. This is a, a Google chart, but you click through to each of those. We mocked up uh, the, the UI for each of the different forms and got them signed off that way. Um, yeah, so it's used by 150 councils in New South Wales. Uh, now Plomino, well this is the nice thing I really like about Plomino. That's how you create a form. You, you use these buttons here, you can create a new field, um, creates the field for you, you say it's like a, you know, a new, numeric field, you can put in some code and so on. Um, it gives complete control over the layout of the field uh, form, which is very different than Plone Form Gen, where it's just in a linear list. Uh, there's the theme is there, and um, what's really interesting is that uh, all the certificates, we generate PDF certificates for you know, pool owners and stuff. That's all using Diazo. Uh, so that's, in, uh, again, we can hand that over to the, uh, the, counts, uh, to the, to the government and say, go modify your own templates. You, know, you want to add a few extra words in there, they can add it straight into the template here. So it's combining a uh, Plomino form with a template and then doing PDF generation. Uh, and the code's all there as well. So if we really need to make a small change to the code, mostly what we're doing is we're um, developing it all locally. We're doing full acceptance tests using robot framework uh, locally. Um, and then we take that zip file and we deploy the whole lot. So we deploy the application like you would a theme. Um, so we did deploy some code, but as I said, we try to make it generic. Uh, so with the PDF generation, um, unfortunately, the way sub-requests work, et cetera, we had to uh, modify it a little bit so that it included uh, Diazo. That wasn't in, uh, we couldn't get Diazo working with the, uh, with the PDF generation without uh, doing that bit. Um, that one's kind of misnamed. We'll probably uh, release that because it's pretty plone. Uh, it's, not, it's not specific to Pomino. Um, this collective, pfg.signup, it's kind of cool. It's a, it's a module for PFG. It's a save adapter that creates users and allows you a workflow to say this group of users is allowed to uh, approve these other group of users. Uh, so all the users get created and then they jump into the Plomino application. Um, again, so that's an idea of something that's very generic, a little bit of configuration. Um, and yeah, there was some extra stuff we had to get imported um, because of uh, issues with restricted Python. We just stuck that all into Plomino lib. Um, Victorian SES, it's another example. We, we, it has, it's mainly a content site, but it includes an application for caravan planning, emergency, they get same sort of thing, a PDF gets generated um, uh, as part of it. But yeah, we use listing views in there as well. And so yep, that was a, what I talked about before. That's uh, the configuration of listing views. Um, so um, you've got the item fields, these are things uh, taken from the current context of the item, and then if that context happens to be a folder, or that context happens to be a collection, then it will also list all of these. And then you've got this editor where you can edit these custom fields and they can be tail expressions. Um, so we've, we've done complex sites and we've done them completely without deploying any custom specific eggs. Uh, so in conclusion, why, why this is good for government? All our clients are pretty much government, so uh, I'm gonna talk about it from that perspective. So they love the cloud. Governments love the cloud. They love handing responsibility to someone else and having a contract and saying, you guys host it, um, and we just pay you X amount, and, and we'll choke your throat if uh, it all goes wrong. 
so they love SLAs and stuff like that. Um, they can also, cloud services allow uh, governments to try without consultation. They can go in there and they can try it out. Problem is if they get in consultants, if they want to talk to you and you suddenly become, you know, then there's a, an accusation that maybe you're sort of influencing the, their decision before they're properly evaluated. They like to evaluate things in their own time, in their own way. And cloud stuff allows them to do that to some extent. Uh, they love fixed price contracts. Um, but there's a big problem with fixed price contracts is that if they want code changes, if uh, something like that, then suddenly if that wasn't anticipated before, then they've got to go and ask for more money. And the one thing that public servants don't like is asking anyone for new money. Um, they normally have a budget. They don't always think about possible changes later on. And if the budget goes, then you're screwed. Um, So one solution that we use quite a bit with our customers is we train them on how to use Diazo. We hand over the HTML and CSS to them and say, make those code changes. And that's been quite successful. We've had uh, you know, people who know HTML and CSS. We've given them the ability to make small changes. They don't have to come back to us. We provide a support contract that allows them to ask questions. Um, and same thing with the Plomino forms. They can sort of change those words around the forms and things like that. And we just say, don't touch the code. So, uh, But if they know Python, a little more training, if they're at that level, then we can say, touch the code. You know, go change the business logic. Um, the other thing about going eggless, I think, is innovation. Uh, so if you give people, uh, there's that old uh, expression, you know, if you, if you uh, give a man a fish, then uh, he'll eat for a day, right? But uh, if you if you teach a man uh, a cloud-based application builder, they could probably uh, you know use their local knowledge in order to build an entire online business, right? It allows them to express themselves, and they know their domain. The people building the sites, they know their domain well, and we've seen this over and over that we couldn't uh, understand how the Victorian SES works as well as they could. So. They built that entire website themselves using Diazo, and they made it exactly how they wanted it, without these long kind of processes of going backwards and forwards with change requests. Uh, so why Eagles is great for Plon. So the complexity of Plon, the complexity of deploying and managing and, and trying to understand all the possible ways of uh, uh, customizing Plon is killing us. Uh, and I think even more importantly, the hosting is killing us. It's not easy to obtain to get a, a Plone site. Uh, to Paul, what Paul talked about, you know, we've got too many plugins. If you use Diazo, if you use these kind of techniques where uh, what you're doing is you're having very generic building blocks that you then customize, we actually have less plugins. The number of plugins we now just d deploy to do a, a site is far, far less. Um, for example, I was asked to, we needed a sign up form for doing a calendar thing, but the requirements were such that they wanted approval from their manager. The manager had to be worked out from LDAP, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going there, I'm going like this, there's five different sign up forms, plugins and plone, and none of them do that. So I can go and hack the crap out of those things and override them and stuff like that. Or I could just build an implomino. Um, so most importantly, I think that what we can do is we can grow Plone by making it fun again. We can make it accessible to more people. We can make sites quick to, to, to create. Uh, you know, one of the, the most uh, soul-destroying things is seeing how many people put blogs on WordPress when they're Plone people. That shouldn't be the case. We should have something that you can say to your grandmother, if you want a, a, a blog, go to plow.com and create it. And you click two buttons, and then you're there. Um, so we keep kind of going back to this thing, right? It's a great community, it's a great community, it's a great community. It is a great community, it is an awesome community, but we should also have, you know, this great piece of software that you can recommend to a taxi driver. That's, that's where I think we should be. Um, so let's, let's get eggless. That's it. Questions? Uh, we say that, um, so for instance, depending on the customer, like we either give them the level of training they need, 
Uh, or we say, if you touch the code, it breaks your support contract. So, yeah. Um, I think Plomino, uh, one of the things we'd like to implement in Plomino is, is, is dual sets of permissions. So you've got the forms versus the code so that you can lock certain parts out. Um, Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've had a few. It's 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 all. About, I mean, the training is incredibly important to, and also to read the person to find out exactly which level they're at if they are able to do that. Um, uh, but generally, yeah. I mean, one thing that we can do, for instance, is we we will give them. A support contract, which means you can ask any questions and stuff like that. But we'll also say, okay, you know, if you need us to do emergency coding stuff, which is not included in our support contract, you buy a block of time, and then they have that up their sleeve. If they really screw it up, then we can go in there and code the crap out of it and fix it. So, um, but you know, we've had one of our uh, big sites. They, you know, they we developed the entire front page for them and developed the whole theme and everything like that. A year later, we gave them the Diazo training. She completely changed the front page. We didn't think they could do it. They did it. It works great. So, uh, yep. What about upgrading that kind of customization? I mean, uh, you you don't have any clue about the 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 thing that they are going to develop. So, what about when uh, Plum Five will come out and you have to? Pretty much anywhere you go, you've got problems upgrading. I think you have less problems if you've got less plugins. And if things like Diazo, um, the kind of dependencies there, you're depending on the structure of the HTML. So as long as the structure of the HTML doesn't change. Um, in theory, I think that upgrading should be simpler with this kind of um, system. Um, yeah, I mean, th this is one of the biggest problems I find is that when I used to do things with, with uh, overrides of uh, so overrides, for instance, if you do a template override of a plugin, you go, I want to change the sort of business logic there, so I do an override of a view. Often what you end up doing is taking a large chunk of code or a large chunk of a template, and you're saying, and all you're really doing is changing one word in there or something like that, right? And so what happens is that the plugin gets upgraded, and then all that business logic gets changed underneath, and you have to do this diff, and you have to say, well, what was I intending to customize? Well, I was just intending to customize one word. I was finding I was commenting every time I was doing uh, you know, some kind of customization. So the only reason for overriding this particular template was to change this, et cetera, et cetera. So then I would have to reverse engineer how to do it with the next version. Uh, and it made upgrades a real pain. Uh, yep. So for those of us not ready to go eggless, are the listing views, can you export them? Can you export them? They're in the registry, so uh, you can export them using generic setup in the registry. Uh, Nate. Uh, back to upgrades, but like, are your first custom eggless customers still on their initial clone version, or did you upgrade them to latest? Versions. Uh, they're all still on their initial plan version. Yep. Which is? Uh, 4.1. We're still on 4.1 uh, for okay. most of our customers. Yep. Okay. Because I mean, this is the thing. We, we've got one big shared um, platform, so all the new South Wales people, they're all on the the one system. Mm -hmm. um, so upgrading the whole lot at one go is uh, potentially difficult. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rock. Uh, hi. Uh, about the Git push yep. uh, thing, have you try, have you thought about using uh, uh, Git implementation in JavaScript? So not relying on the server side, which means basically you could have it anywhere and at any time. So it's not only then Plone specific. So where are you going to store the data? No, no, no. You talk directly. So you get a file, edit it, commit it, and you can push it. Yeah, I think, yeah, you just blew my mind there. <laughs> if, if that works, then, yeah. I, I mean, my, my, uh, my idea is that, you know, the, the plone becomes one place you push to, so it's got all the versions there. So when it's not just pushing in there, but if you go to the theme editor, for instance, and go take, make changes, it's going to create a commit straight away. And that commits back in, and then you can download, and you can see the whole history of all the different... I mean, one of the things we miss at the moment in theming is there's no history. There's no undo. 
You know, you make a change there, and if you haven't copied it, you can't really go backwards um, that easily. So it would help solve that problem as well. Any other questions? Cool. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>